الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اما بعد one of the important characteristics that Allah Azza wa Jalla has made wajib and lazim upon every Muslim is the fact that we all have to make jihad to be fair and we have to be just. Most people are not fair and most people are not just from this ummah and from other than this ummah. We're not fair with our wives, with our children, we're not fair in the way we look at issues, we're not fair in the way we even deal with our own selves. To be just is one of the characteristics of Al-Islam that are extremely important. Allah mentioned in many ayat of the Quran, Allah ya'murukum an tu'addul amanati ila ahliha wa idha hakamtum bayna al-nasi an tahkumu bil adil. Allah has ordered you to give back the amanat that have been left in your charge. Give them back. And if you're put in a position to judge between people and situations, to be fair and just. In the law, you hibbu and local sitin. Allah loves those who are fair, those who are just. Many ayat. Prophet mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the seven people will be under Allah's shade, yomul qiyamah. On the day there will be no shade except his shade. The very first person he mentioned, Imam Adil. The Imam who was fair and just. He doesn't have to be fair and just, he's the Imam. He does whatever he wants to do. But because he was fair and just and he had power over the people and his subjects, and he executed the Adil, he'll be one of those seven people. He was the first one who was mentioned. So the more power that you have, the more ability that you have, and you exemplify justice, it's one of the best issues. Some of you look at me like a, you googly eyed. Being fair and just is a sifa that's mafkul, that's lost with most other people. You hear things, you make an opinion. You didn't hear the other side. You form an opinion. You say things about people, you don't even know the half of it, and you're talking. Most people are not fair and most people are not just. Multiple children, they're not fair with them. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Inna al-muqasiteen ala manabir min nur yawm al-qiyamati an yameen al-rahman wa kilta yadayhi yameen al-ladhina ya'adiluna fi hukmihim wa ahlihim wa ma'ullu the people who are fair and just in this dunya, they're going to be on the right side of Allah. And both of Allah's hands are right hands. Both of them are right. They'll be on manabir made out of nur, on the right side of Allah's hands. Yomul Qiyam. Who are they? Those people who are fair and just with their families. They're fair and just when they give a ruling, a hukum. And they're fair and just when they've been made responsible for things. Most people in every row in this mission are not fair and just. I don't say that to put anyone down, but that's the reality. He has multiple children. He loves his first child more than everybody else. He loves his last child more than everybody else. And he shows that. The child that exceeds academically, for an example, the one who's not a problem, he shows his love for that one over the others. Not fair, not just. He has multiple wives. One of them is with him here, and the other one is somewhere in the Bilad, back where he comes from. He's forgotten her. Fair and just. So we have to be people who are fair and just. And one ayah said, وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوَ الْوَالِدَيْنْ وَالْأَقْرَبِينَ You have to be fair and just even if it's against yourself, if it's against your mother and your father, if it's against your relatives. So if I'm going to be fair and just against myself, my mother and my father, my relatives, then, in Babel Ola, I'm going to be fair and just against people who are lesser in station than that. 
So in being fair and just, one thing I have to say that I've said in this message many times, this country right here, the UK, the Muslim has to be fair and just. This country is not like any other Western country, bar none. No other country is parallel to the UK and the way they deal with the Muslims. This country, when Donald Trump, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, that racist, that bigot, when he said, we shouldn't allow Muslims into America. This country, the members of parliament, they discussed that issue on the floor in Parliament. And they had a robust discussion. And the members of Parliament, some of them got up and went on record saying, we shouldn't allow this man into our country. Even if he wins the presidency, that's racism and that's bigotry. We shouldn't allow him to the country. Other people from the members of Parliament said, no, we should let him come, but we should educate him. Some people were not fair and just, they listen to what I'm saying. People who are ignorant, people who have hidden agendas, people who just don't understand what you're saying, people who are politically oriented, they think that what I'm saying right now, they misunderstand what I'm saying. They think that I'm saying these people from the members of parliament here are from the Odi of Allah, and they're in the Jannah, and they're Muslims, and they're people of Tawheed. I didn't say that. I said that they're fair and they're just. Tell me another country where they discuss that issue in their chamber of parliament. Somebody tell me about that. Even in America, they don't do that. That's fairness on their part, and that's the reality. This country, right here, in the UK, that opened up its doors, and here we are sitting here, taking advantage of a better way of life, inshallah, as far as the dunya is concerned, and in many instances, as far as our religion is concerned, they did not make a harm or a war against the hijab and the niqab like what we have in Paris and other than Paris, in France. They did not stop Muslims from slaughtering animals for their Eid, Eid al-Adha. Some of you come from countries, you know the qima of making the fabiha for your aqeeqa and for the Eid al-Adha. Ajim, people who accepted Islam, we don't know the reality of, the seriousness of having a child and making a fabiha. This is part of where we come from, it's our culture, it's our religion. Overseas, there are certain places in the West you can't slaughter an animal. Although they're not vegetarians, they kill the animals in a way that's inhumane, but they say, Muslims, you people can't kill animals like that. They didn't do that to us. They allowed us to build institutions like Masajid, like Madaris, like the Duxi, to memorize the Quran. We can make the Adhan, we can make the Khutbatul Juma. Where we come from in Birmingham, we make the event outside. They didn't stop that. Again, that doesn't mean that I'm saying these people from the Odi of Allah, they're the people of the Tawheed. That doesn't mean we make Tadib of what Allah said in the Quran. They don't going to be happy to you to follow their religion. So normative Islam is under attack. But I want to preface and prelude what I have to say, my message today. Well, I'm fair and I'm just, inshallah. And I'm going to call this community to be fair and being just. Acknowledge and recognize reality. America, you have problems. You have problems if you're a Muslim. You can lose your life. Police can shoot you in the ground like a dog, and the cop is going to get off scot free. It's not like that here. It's not like that here. So we start that off by saying the UK is not like any other country, but at the same time, the UK and the policy of the UK is against us. And that's the message I want to bring to you. I'm not trying to spread mass hysteria amongst you. I'm trying to raise your level of awareness about a serious issue. The Muslims, unfortunately, are extremely immature, immature. To a daraja, Allah is something strange. I think if a person is a psychiatrist and he were to look at us, he would say, this is an ummah, these people are majaneen. Here they are having ikhtilaf between themselves about trivial issues. Here they are, they don't realize they have every reason to come together. They have every reason to be united. 
They have every reason to put their resources together to move their community forward, but instead, they choose to be disunited amongst themselves, hating each other in the same mischief. I'm not talking about the other mischief. There are policies that are being passed on a daily basis, going under the radar, and the Muslims are still on some other issue playing softball, and these people are playing hardball, trying to eradicate El Islam. So I came here to elevate your awareness about an issue. It's not about hysteria. It's not about getting from you a knee-jerk reaction. It's about you being aware, especially those of you who have children. And if you don't have a child, the issue is coming your way. If we don't do something about it, the issue is coming your way still. But if you have a child, you have to be sensitive to what's going on. You have to be aware of what's going on. And this is part of the responsibility of the masajid, the imams, and the idarat, the administrations of our masjids. There is something in this country that is called prevent. Prevent. Prevent is a four-point program. Four. One, two, three, four. A four-pronged program in which the government has passed a number of laws so to stop extremism and radicalism in this country. But when they say extremism and stopping radicalism, that's synonymous with extremism with the Muslims, radicalism with the Muslims. Although they are Christians who are far right, the EDL, the BMP, people who are extreme, Jews who are extreme, Christians who are extreme, but this targets the Muslims only. The general thing is extremism, generally. But the way it's being applied is only against the Muslims. Some Muslims never even heard what is prevent. A four-point program in which the government is trying to stop radicalization and extremism. And they want me as the imam, and other imams, rightly so, to get up in front of the member, in front of the community, and say, hey, we have to be people who are balanced and not extreme. I don't need the government to tell me that. I don't need a non-Muslim to tell me that. That's my religion. That's my religion. I'm going to tell you, we have extreme Muslims from amongst us in this country. I'm not talking about ISIS, I'm not talking about Boko Haram, I'm not talking about Shabbat, I'm not talking about Qaeda, I'm not talking about Taliban, I'm talking about here in the UK. Your child, your child, your cousin, your neighbor, we have young people who are extreme here. So when Allah's Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stop your brother, whether he is oppressed or he is the oppressor. They say, Ya Rasulullah, we know how to stop him if he is oppressed. We got to help him, help your brother. But what if he is, what if, we know if he's the oppressor, we got to stop him. But what if he's oppressed? He says, stop him from being the oppressor. So the Quran and the Sunnah told us, we got to advise each other. Don't go overboard, Ahi. Hey, hey, you, 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 your son, watch what he's doing. Be aware of what, what, what's going on in your community. Know what's happening with our youngsters what they're visiting, the sites on the internet. That's what Allah and his messenger told us. I don't need anybody to tell me that. One thing the government doesn't want, they don't want the imams to get on the member and say the other side of the equation. And that is, the government is partly responsible for creating extremism amongst our Shabbat. It's not just our Shabbat who are young, youthful exuberance, no knowledge, they respond to issues, and as a result of ignorance, they do things that are crazy. Some of them are sincere, some of them are sincere. So when they look at how the illegal, unjust war that was perpetrated against the Iraqi people, that was a war that was unjust, it wasn't fair, according to the United Nations. It was illegal, and nothing happened to the people who made it happen in America in this place right here. Now this is not a political khutbah. This is a khutbah raising your awareness. But I have to put this question out there. Fairness and justice. The Hague. The Hague. It's amazing that whenever African leaders do something 
That's crazy. They kill their people. They're responsible for genocide. The Hague is always going after African leaders. They don't go after anyone else. What about the white leaders? What about the European leaders? What about George Bush, who was responsible for the illegal war in Iraq? Iraq is still, the problem is still reverberating. To this day, 500,000 people have died in Syria and Iraq. So here's this young Muslim. He comes and he sees a bomb that was dropped on, pocket, uh, on, on people from Afghanistan, killing old people, men and women, children. And he says, okay, in our religion, the Muslim body is like one body. If one part of the body aches, the other part of the body aches. So when America drops a bomb on a hospital in Afghanistan, kills all those people, and then comes and slaps them in the face and say, we'll give you $3,000 to $4,000 for each dead person. That young person from our community becomes extreme because the government, they don't want to take responsibility. They even say, this was wrong. All they want the imam to do is come before you and to say, hey, don't be extreme. Don't be extreme. No, we're going to call it the way it is. We're going to say to the Muslims, you have to learn your religion. And in learning your religion, the way that some of the people exist is not ex acceptable. Al-Wala wal-Bara and al-Jihad. It has faham and it has fiqh. It has ahkam. It's not your emotions. It's not for you to allow your emotions to tatahakkum fiqh. It's not permissible. And also, when we see people doing crazy things, you can't respond in a crazy way. Two wrongs don't make it right. When I get you the kum shana anu komin ala and la ta deal, a deal who upabu takwa. Don't let someone who oppress you, don't let that cause you to be oppressed. Be fair and just, it's closer to takwa. So prevent. One of the things about prevent that I want to bring to your attention, and this is the issue, is that the government has made it so that those people who work in the public sector, like teachers, psychiatrists, doctors, people who the public has to go and see, they work in the public sector. The government in prevent are taking these people, policemen and people like this, teachers, lawyers, and they're giving them training, one hour and a half. The teacher has to go and he gets training. Training to be able to identify extremism. Extremism with who? The Muslim student, the Muslim patient, the Muslim who has mental issues and challenges. And if that non-Muslim, for an example, sees what he perceives as being strands and examples of, of, of extremism, they call the authorities and they come and they kick your door down. Wake up and smell the coffee. I'll give you some examples. If you think that I'm here joking with you and playing some games, there are 500, five, five, zero, zero, 500 children from the age five to 10 only. I'm not talking about the ones who are 11 and above. 500 cases of children from the ages of 5 to 10, 500, who their families have been approached. Some of them, their doors kicked down after these so-called professionals <coughs> raised the alarm. And I'll give you some of the examples of what actually happened to show you why you as a parent, as a father, an absent father, left everything for his, for his wife to deal with these kids. His kid is on the computer, his kid is on PlayStation, his kid is going and coming. He knows nothing about what's going on in the life of his kid. It's all on the warning. Now you can't be an absent father because the price to pay is serious right now because innocence will cause problems. And there are many examples, 500, I'll only give you three or four. One example, it happened the other day, it's in the news, it just happened. The kid was told in the school Everybody describe what's going on in your households. What's going on with your families? What do your families do? A kid wrote a story about his father helping his mother in the kitchen, cooking for the family, and he was chopping up cucumbers. Cucumbers. 
you know, the pickles, cucumbers. But the little kid, the little kid, four, about to go to five, he said my father was chopping up and cutting up cocoa bombs. A cocoa bomb. And he messed up in how he wrote the word, pronounced the word. It raised the flag with that person who took an hour and a half of expertise training. They called the police. The police went to the house, kicked the door open. You people making cocoa bombs? And in the house, like your homes and my home, everybody has secrets. Good secrets and bad secrets. May Allah forgive us for the bad secrets. From the good secrets is, my wife, my daughters, they attended a nikah. They attended a walima. And when they went over to where the women sit, they took their hijabs off and their jilbabs, and they had their nice clothes on. And there's a DVD that was made filming the women. I tell my wives, don't go to any walima where the people don't have deen. They're going to take that DVD and show the men of their families. Because that's a secret that's in my house, that DVD, that DVD of your wives, your daughters. I can't sit there and watch that when they don't have their hijabs on. That's my right to privacy, me. But the government, the police come in, they confiscate computers. They confiscate cell phones. They confiscate everything to try to find out about this cocoa bomb. The teacher had to use some type and some level of discretion to say, it's a four-year-old kid. A four-year-old kid. Another example. In the classroom, five-year-old kid. You're a five-year-old kid. Describe to me the house that you people live in. Describe. The kid wrote, I live in a terrace house. He wanted to write terrace house. Terrace house. He said, I live in a terrorist house. A mistake. I used to be in school. Six years old, seven years old, at a teacher, I was fond of her. I raised my hand, I say, Ma, Ma, like, Ummi, Ummi, because I liked her. During that time right now, are they going to now take me to jail, go and tell my parents, you, you, you're, ne you're neglecting him, he's calling another person Ma? Is this a mistake? I like the lady, she was taking care of us, Ma, Ma. The teacher has to use their discretion. The kid wrote, I live in a terrorist house. He wanted to say, I live in a terrorist house. I live in a terrorist house. They came, kicked this door open. Because the kid made a simple mistake. There's a thing here that is called World Book Day. It's in the UK. Our children participate in it. Muslim school, non-Muslim school. It's a day in which they pay homage to literature. So the child is encouraged to do what? He's encouraged to come to school on that day dressed in a costume like some character from a book that he read. There's a Muslim family. The Muslim family was against Halloween. They were on the religion. So when his child was requested, come to school in a Halloween costume, we're gonna have a Halloween program, the father and the mother was passing out leaflets in the school courtyard advising the Muslims, this is not permissible. This is not permissible. Don't do this. We don't have to do this. Don't do it. Don't do it. So the people looked at them. These guys are troublemakers. So when World Book Day came, the mother and the father wanted to go under the radar. Under the radar. They said, we're not going to make any problems. We're going to allow him. We're going to allow him to put on some costume. So he put on a costume where he had a belt with a fake sword, a hanjar, a fake one. He had on a turban, he had on a cape. When he went to school, the teacher asked, who are you, who are you, Peter Pan, who are you, Batman, who are you, Superman? They came to the Muslim kid who had on a turban and a cape. Who are you, Aladdin? Aladdin, Aladdin? You Aladdin? The kid said, how do we not, I'm not Aladdin. Aladdin is haram, he knows the story of Aladdin. Aladdin is playing with the jinn, Aladdin is a liar. Aladdin is stealing in the marketplace. Aladdin does magic. He said, Aladdin, I will be that. It's magic. That's not from our religion. The kid said, I'm Salahuddin. And I will be. The one who liberated Palestine. This is terrorism. This is a sign of extremism. Just because he wanted to be like this fictitious, like this character that came and kicked this door down. He didn't mean anything. He didn't mean anything. 
when this issue happened with Charlie Hebdo, and we told the community, this is not from our religion. This is not from our religion what happened in France. It's not from our religion what happens in Belgium. It's not from our religion what happened in the streets of London. Killing people, cutting their heads off, shooting people, even if they're in the bar in the disco. That's not our religion. We told our community, we're free from that. That's not from our religion. You shouldn't endorse that. You shouldn't do that. So they said across the world, across the world, okay, on your Facebook, you have to make that thing with the French flag to stand in solidarity with the French. I'm not doing that, I don't have to do that. I say that as haram would happen to those French people. The Muslims perpetrated that, that's haram. But I don't have to stand in solidarity by putting a flag on my Facebook and other than that, especially the way France slapped the Muslims all in the face in Algeria and other than that, in the countries in Africa that they have colonized. I don't have to do that. And what's wrong with you that you have to apologize to do that? We just free ourselves from the deed, and that's it. The kid in the school, 16 years old, 15 years old, there was a moment of silence in every school. We're gonna give a moment of silence, two minutes of silence for those people who were killed. The kids, the Muslim kids, one kid say, hey, I have a question. I have a question. Why is it, teacher, why is it that when those people were killed in Pakistan, and the other ones climbed over the fence and shot those innocent students. Why didn't we have a moment of silence? Is it that the blood of white people, and this is not about racism. This is what he said, and it's the reality. And it's a legitimate question. Is the blood of white people better than the blood of people of color? Why don't we have a moment of silence every time something happens in Palestine, in Iraq, in Syria? The teacher said, this is a sign of extremism. This is a sign of radicalism. I remember being young in America. The history in America is Kevin. It's Kevin. They taught us about those presidents, and we were growing up looking at them as if they were heroes, when in reality, when in reality, they were slave masters. They had slaves. They raped slave women. We didn't know that. They were telling us like George Washington, like Abraham Lincoln, like Thomas Jefferson, and we're growing up Listening to that, the Indians were the bad guys and the cowboys were the right ones. The Indians were the savages when in fact it was the other way around. You people went and stole their lands and you gave them diseases. But when we got older, 16, 17 in high school, we had the ability to make a monocasha with the teacher. Hey, this is not historically correct. Christopher Columbus didn't discover America and they would engage us. In discussion. Sometimes the teacher himself would inform us that's Kevin. The tarikh of America is Kevin. Now, the Muslim child can say, hey, that is not historically correct. This thing that you're talking about, the story and history of Israel and Palestine, is not correct what you're saying. If the child says that, he's going to be looked at as being extreme. So, what's the message here? And there are many examples we can give you. Many. The message here is, you have to be on top of your on top of your children. We have to be on top. That's the first message. We have to be people who engage in the minds of our children. The prophet came outside, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he saw a group of kids playing. From them, Anas ibn Umayyad. He said, Anas, come here. He said, I want you to go and do something for me. And it's a secret, so don't tell anyone. Anas went. After he did what he had to do, he went home and he arrived home late. Later than what his mother expected. When his mother saw him coming, he said, what took you so long? Anas ibn Maddox said, I went to take care of a private affair for the Prophet Wasallam. The mother said, what was the private affair? He said it was a private. Or me, it was, it, it was a secret. She was happy with him taking care of the Amana. She said, don't tell anyone about the secret of the Nabi. Protect the secret of your house. You got to sit with your kid. If my child went to the house of his auntie, my wife's sister, and my wife's sister started asking my kids personal questions about me and my wife, I'm not letting him go back to her house again. You know how your child goes to someone's house and comes back and tells you they were asking him about this and this. Don't let him go to the house because those are the asrar of your ahlil bit. Nobody has the right to be asking about those questions. 
That's the edit that we have to teach the child. Because the child is innocent. The child is going to tell the truth. He's only four. He's only five. And that's part of the turbi of the child. Take care of the asrar of the house. So you have to be on top of your kids. What happened today in school? What did they say? Anybody touch you? Anybody bully you? You have to be a father who's in touch with your kid. The second thing, what the message is. What's the message? Second aspect of the message is, when are we going to wake up and smell the coffee? These people are playing hardball against the Muslims. And here we are, still with our jama'at. This is jama'at. That's his jama'at. That's his group. That's his masjid. That's his color. That's his ethnic group. That's his, that's his. And these people are after all of us. And we are on this we're still on this, we're still on this immature and unsophisticated issue. I don't like him and I don't like that one, I don't like that one. And they're trying to extinguish the light of Islam. This khutbah is not to spread mass hysteria. This khutbah is to raise the awareness of you people who are here. These people are trying to take out normative Islam. Your child gets to the point where the normal Islam is something he doesn't want. He wants the Islam of being liberal, rejecting what he wants to reject from the religion, accepting what he wants to accept from the religion, and anybody who doesn't like it, you can go wherever you want to go with that issue. This is the day that we're living in right now. And we brought these kids here, and we find ourselves here. So the challenge is, when are we going to take care of these responsibilities? وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ وَنَسْأَلَ for everybody who is sitting here, everybody has his opinion. Everybody has his opinion about whatever. But the beauty about this religion is there's only one opinion that governs us. And that is the opinion that Allah revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah. And the way that the companions understood those texts and those sources. So when Imam Ahmed, when he was asked a question about an issue that the companions gave a fatwa in, he said, what is your opinion? He said, it's not permissible for me to give an opinion about something that the companions have decided and agreed upon. I can't bring another opinion. I can't bring another opinion. I was on this show last night, still filming with some sisters called, What Do the Muslim Women Want? And this is not your wives, but these are the Muslim women who are upset, who are feminists, and they come. I'm asked the question, how did Al-Islam empower the woman? I gave some examples, Quran and Sunnah. They have the ability to inherit. They have the ability to keep their own names. They don't marry their husbands and take his name. She remains Fatima Bittu Abdullah. He doesn't take his name where she loses her name in this system. She has the ability to marry who she wants. And I told them a hadith. A hadith that's authentic. That the Prophet ﷺ was approached by a man. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I told my daughter to marry her cousin and she refuses. Rasulullah said, listen to your father. The lady said, La wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, until you tell me what is the right of the man over the woman, I'm not going to get married. The Prophet said, showing his hikmah, using a metaphor. It's a metaphor. It's not real. It's a metaphor to show the serious hawk that the Zoj has over him. Like, if I were to order someone to make sajda to someone else, I would order the woman to make sajda. It's like that. You can't make sajda to anyone. He was giving an example. He said, the hak of the man over the woman is, if he has a sore in his nose and has blood and pus, and she was to lick it out and clean it and swallow it, she wouldn't have given him the hak. The woman, when she heard that, said, well, Allah, he, by the one who sent you with the truth, I will not get married. The prophet wasn't telling her to do that. He was giving an example of the ta'zim of the haq of the zuj. As soon as I said that hadith on TV, these women started saying, oh, 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 what is that? What is that? That hadith is da'if. That's not a hadith. The prophet, hey, lady, the hadith that's authentic has five conditions. Do you know one? She doesn't know one. She wants to empower herself with something outside of Islam. She wants to get strength and power with what's outside of Islam. 
You are, you are, you are on a way of destruction. Just reject the hadith because it goes against you. Now, if you remain calm and you said, but some husbands use this hadith, some imams use this hadith, some men use this hadith to oppress women. I say, you're right. But don't tell me the prophet, this is not an authentic hadith. What you want, you take. What you don't want, you don't take. The ayat said, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنِ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمَ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It's not befitting for a believing man or a believing woman. If Allah is messaged to decide a thing that had any say so. But that's the new Islam. That's the new Islam. And until we stand up and face these challenges, things are going to get increasingly worse. So Ummah to Islam, the time has come for us to take the responsibility as men of our families first and foremost, and then to parlay that, and to parallel that to taking care of the affairs of the Ummah at the Masjid. So in concluding, in concluding, we need to get with the program. We need to get with the program. Those of you who are parents, wake up, get connected to your kids, and ask your kids, what's being questioned? What's being asked of you? Who's touching you? Who's bullying you? What's going on in school? What are people saying and doing to you? And then do and take the right course and the right action concerning that. We ask Allah to forgive all of us for our mistakes, for our shortnesses and our shortcomings and our indiscretions and to have mercy upon us and to show favor upon us. And we ask Allah to establish our feet firmly. And as the winds of adversity blow, that it gives us the flexibility to go with those winds. And he doesn't allow us to break. He doesn't allow us to leave our religion. doesn't allow us to become apologetic and to acquiesce and to change the complexion and the reality of this religion. Atim as-salat, yarhamakumullah.